The Centers for Disease Control reports the deadly MERS virus has reached the United States. Last month, an American man traveled from Saudi Arabia to Indiana via London and Chicago. He was admitted to a hospital suffering from shortness of breath, coughing, and fever, and diagnosed with Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS for short. Previously, MERS had been found in a dozen countries, all in the Middle East and Europe. Let's take a closer look and find out just how dangerous it is. Joining us is Jeffrey Kluger, Senior Science Editor for Time Magazine. Jeffrey, good morning. Good morning. How concerned should we be about this? Well, the numbers by themselves aren't too terrifying yet. There have been 400 cases since 2012. Uh, 320 of them in Saudi Arabia. The problem is the death rate is 94 of those 320 cases be because there's no, disease, there's no cure and there's no treatment for this disease yet. It's been linked to bats and camels, so how did it come to humans? Well, it came to humans. Species jumping is a difficult thing, but when it happens, it means that the, the virus adapts comfortably across species lines. Now, once it gets to us, it transmits human to human in very much the way colds and flus do. It can be airborne, but also, unfortunately, it can be left on surfaces and doorknobs. That's exactly what you see with colds. That's exactly what you see with flus. The World Health Organization in a new, new report warns that cases of MERS, MERS could spike during the spring. Why would that happen? Well, because more camels are born during the spring, for one thing, which uh -huh. simply increases the camel population. And also, we know that certain viruses simply do better in certain seasons. Think of polio in the summertime and colds and flu in the winter. It's hotter, it's colder, it's wetter or drier. Those particular viruses viruses adapt to those conditions. There was one other headline in that report that Antony mentioned that it caught everyone's attention here in our newsroom. We are heading for a post-antibiotic era in which common infections and minor injuries can once again kill. What does that mean? Well, that means that antibiotics, the first antibiotic was developed in 1928. We haven't penicillin. We haven't developed a great many since then. We have overused these to the point that the bacteria themselves are evolving around them. So we're developing antibiotic resistant medications that simply can hit back or antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria that can hit back at the drugs that are being thrown at them. So what does that mean in terms of what we because it, as you mentioned they're so common now in many cases people go to them too quickly. That's what do we have to do to respond to this situation? Well there are a lot of things we have to do. Doctor Doctors must be prescribing these drugs more judiciously, and they cannot be yielding to patients who simply walk in and say, I would like this antibiotic, I want to feel better, so give me a powerful one. Patients must be taking the entire cycle of these drugs. If you stop as soon as you feel better, what you're doing is selecting for the handful of those bugs that survive that first assault. Then you're releasing those superbugs into the world. It also seems like there's no, no new drugs. I mean, in this, in this arena, are doctors lacking in research in creating new types of antibiotics? Yeah, we haven't had a new category of antibiotics in 30 years, and that's the problem. So the common diseases that are being affected by this diarrheal diseases, urinary tract diseases, staph infections, uh, neonatal infections. We have now 50% failure rates in last line treatments for uh, certain diseases like certain pneumonias and certain gonorrheas. That's people who are left with absolutely no, no medical answer, no pharmaceutical answer to their condition it's at all. It's scary, Jeffrey. I mean, it's scary. Yeah, I mean, it was too much of a good thing. And we do have to be taking these drugs, using them more judiciously. And finally, when people don't finish them, do not flush them down the toilet because you introduce drugs into the water system and that actually gives us a low level background exposure to drugs that we shouldn't be taking. And quickly then, what is proper disposal? Proper disposal is to take them back to drugstores where they're disposed of properly. And also, when you get that drug cycle, you shouldn't be throwing any of them away after all. If you get 30 pills, take 30 pills until that bottle is empty. Jeffrey Kluger, thank you so much.